right, hello everyone. Um, you are here today with myself, Becky Strong, and Lori Rentoul, and we are both from Pathways as Employment Specialists. And we are here today to talk about hidden roles of the workplace. Some of this is common sense, some of it maybe isn't so common, which is what we're going to address today. Uh, but before we start, I want to encourage you to follow us on Instagram and Facebook um, so that you can see any kind of announcements that we have there. The information for all of these webinars would be on there as well as different um, communications that we have about upcoming programs or spotlights that we have on either um, our staff here or some of the client stories that we're sharing. So we would encourage you guys to follow us both on there. And Lori, if I'm correct, these are posted to YouTube for future reference, these webinars, is that right? Yes, and it's, if you just search Pathways, it's hard to find us on YouTube, but if you search Pathways Skill Development, then you should be able to find us. Perfect. Okay, so hidden rules of the workplace, what are they? So these are kind of things that are never really written down anywhere. Um, there are things that people assume that you know, but maybe you don't know because you haven't been there before. You've never experienced this before. So this presentation is more about helping just to recognize that there may be situations where there's different protocol, different things that you should know that maybe no one's ever explained to you, but they're very, very, very important. So it changes based on what situation you find yourself in. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but typically people think that if you don't know, it's because you're, you're stupid, right? How can you not know that? Everybody knows that. It's not about that so much. It's just being aware of the surroundings that you're in and paying attention to what's going on around you and being kind of having that conversation of what's important and what are, what are the kind of underlying messages that are being communicated by maybe some of the things that we do or we don't do or we say or we don't say. Um, so for instance, let's take an example of hidden rules at the grocery store. So Lori, before you pop that stuff up on the screen, in the chat, I would encourage you to, I'm gonna turn off the video here. Um, I would encourage you to tell me, just put it in the chat bar, what are some things that you just know to be true of the way that you have to act or the way that things function in a grocery store? And let's say in normal time. Yeah, it's not necessarily in COVID land. <laughs> yeah, because that we could be here forever with all the rules about, you know, going to the grocery store now. And I cannot seem to navigate the one way aisles. I, I'm always going the wrong way. Okay, so we have one person that's already made me laugh because it says be considerate of others. Um, be fully dressed. <laughs> that's a good one. You know, it's, it's kind of what <laughs> another one says, generally take your turn and wear pants. <laughs> really exciting grocery stores. If someone just made a call out to oh. a client and they got cut off, call me at the front desk, they're on line three. That would be Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where no shirt, no shoes, no service. That's pretty common. Someone else just said, don't eat the produce or sample. Yeah. Um, in this hot summer weather, it, you know, you get all kinds of things happening when people oh, yeah. are out and about. I mean, what do they say always? Like, if you want the best entertainment, go to Walmart because it's oh, like yeah. Walmart shoppers. Yeah. Yeah. Another one says, do not try a five-finger discount. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, let's, let's go through these. Yeah. So we'll go through what we have. Right. So when you go into the grocery store, you know that you're supposed to use a cart. You don't usually, I mean, now you can bring in your own reusable shopping bags, but you know, you typically start your, your thing with a cart or a basket that's provided by the store. That just makes it easier. Um, so you wanna walk up the right side of the aisle. Now this is not something that everybody does. And when they don't do it, it frustrates you because people should just know that this is how you function and walk in a grocery store. Now, again, different with COVID. It doesn't matter. You go up one way and down the other because of the arrows, but essentially you just know that when you're going in a grocery store, it's like driving on the road. You drive one way on the right hand side, you drive on the other way on the left hand side. You can't go on both sides. Um, 
be polite with other shoppers. Don't reach in front of anyone to grab anything <laughs> or grab things from their cart. Yeah, that would be a no-no. Um, I don't think that I would appreciate it if somebody saw something that was delicious in my cart and just decided to take it for their own. You don't do that. Yeah. If you see something that you like, you would go back and get it. You don't take it from someone else. Um, yeah, you get in line to pay. Um, you have to wait your time in line and you have to give an ample space to be able to protect that person's privacy, especially if they're paying, uh, if they're using their debit card or if they're bagging up their groceries, you wait. You need to know, like you don't need to be impatient. Um, that's just common courtesy. Um, yeah, load items onto the conveyor and bag them up after. So you know that you shouldn't take your card up and look at the cashier and say, okay, this is what I want to buy. You know that you have to take the things out of your cart. You have to put them on the conveyor belt. You know, typically you would do that in order so your bread stuff is together so that it doesn't get swished with or squished with the canned goods, that sort of thing. And it's a process to go through. Um, you're going to ask for bags if you didn't bring them or bring your own bag. And you obviously don't start putting things in your bag until it's been run through the cash register so that they can record that you're buying it. Um, it sounds really silly to say, um, but these are the things that you just know to be true about how to go and function and, and get your groceries. Um, and again, you return your cart after you're done. You don't just take your bags and walk out and leave the cart where the cash register is. You have to go and you put it back. So I have quite a few comments here. I'm just going to okay. read them. Um, somebody asked, does the right-hand side of the aisle work in the countries with the right-hand drive? Maybe. No, it doesn't. I found this out from a client one time. In countries where they drive on the left, they go up the left-hand side of the aisles in the grocery store. So I can never get groceries in Europe, ever. No. Well, not I would be the anyway. person that would break the rules. <laughs> You can't go in England or Jamaica or Japan or any of those places where they drive on the other side. Oh, somebody was saying that my audio was just breaking up. I apologize, guys. Um, we're using different cameras now that we're in the office and they don't seem to be as good as the ones that we were using at home, so I apologize. Um, okay, and that was about it. Oh, the other one was stay with your cart. Don't walk away from it and block the aisle. That's so yeah. true. That's a good one too. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about elevators. So when, you know, we can do the same thing. When you guys use an elevator, what are some things that you typically just know to be true as far as how to behave in an elevator? Uh, let's see here. Don't block the door, press only your stop and, on, and ask um, to press by others. Do not jump inside, do not hold up the elevator. Uh, face the doorway. That's another one. I think there's a common courtesy too. Like when I get on the elevator in my building and if I have my hands free, I'll ask the other person, which floor would you like and push the button for them instead of just looking at how they're going to struggle to do that. So that's, that's a good one. Um, no smoking inside. Absolutely. That would be horrific. If you got caught in an elevator with someone who was smoking a cigarette or anything else. Mm -hmm. Don't sing in the elevator or it might break. Huh. I, I don't think I've ever sang in the elevator, but I didn't know that it might break. <laughs> no. No. Uh, this is a good one. Letting it people depends on who's singing. <laughs> what? It depends on who's singing. True. True. Uh, so you let people off the elevator before you enter. It's just like if you were on a subway, you know, if you're in a busy city. You can't get on until somebody else makes space to get off. So give them the space to get off. Um, facing the exit doors, absolutely. Someone said that. Um, offer to push buttons for others if you're standing next to the button panel. Absolutely. I mean, that again, this is common sense, but not necessarily so common. Um, if the elevator's full, you're going to wait for the next one. Usually there's a wait capacity or an occupancy capacity. <laughs> But quite honestly, if I was the one that was stuck in the corner of the elevator that people were all smushed in trying to get into, it would not be a pleasant experience for me. And I would be annoyed with people thinking that that was okay. Um, be courteous, don't chat too much with the other riders. I have a dog 
And when I use the elevator in the apartment that I'm in, it's, it's funny to see how people react. Some people are absolutely terrified of my dog. And now with COVID, it's a little bit different because they're encouraging you to ride the elevator by yourself. Um, but before, you know, you really need to read as to whether or not you feel a person is okay with the animal being on there because some people are very afraid of them and, and you have to be aware because that's when I would wait. Um, but if I wasn't being observant of, of the other people that were on there, that could be very scary for someone because they would be, I don't, I don't have a small dog. Mm. Um, so, and she's extremely friendly and thinks that everybody should love her. So she doesn't just sit quietly in the corner, but I, so I have to be aware because not necessarily is that a rule of riding the elevator, but I'm being courteous of the other people that are in there. So same thing goes with being too chatty. Oh, is that the other, only other one? All right. Um, there was a couple other things on the chat. Um, oh, there was a comment that added to the singing in the elevator. Apparently that has happened to this person before that the elevator broke. So <laughs> okay, that's not a good day. All right. So the last one we're going to talk about is hidden rules of the job interview. So again, what do you assume to be just common practice when you're going into an interview? Uh, what are some things that you just know that you would automatically do or that seem like it's a very common decision to make before you go into that situation? So I'll give you just a couple seconds if anybody has some input. Uh, first one, be on time. We like you. <laughs> Being on time is probably one of the most important things. Um, another person said being polite to everyone you meet there. That's really, really important. You never know who you're talking to. Don't make assumptions that you know kind of where they fall in place in the company. Uh, avoid fidgeting, do not interrupt, listen more than you speak. Um, that's probably true, except you wanna make sure that you're answering the questions. So sometimes people don't say enough in an interview uh, because they get nervous. So there's a good balance there. Um, but for us, <laughs> show up sober. Always a good thing to remember. That's important, yeah. yeah. That's really important. So dressing professionally. Now this doesn't mean that you have to um, show up in a suit and tie, but you wanna be able to present yourself in uh, an appropriate way based on the job that you're going for. Um, so you wanna make sure that you've put yourself together, whatever that looks like. So making sure your clothes are clean, making sure that they're tucked in, that they're buttoned up right. Um, that they're, they're not ripped, they're not sloppy looking. You just know, because again, we've talked about this in so many different ways, you're trying to make a first impression. So your assumption would be, I have to look good. Um, nobody's really gonna tell you to do that. You should just know to do that. But some people don't think that far ahead. Uh, arriving early, not too early, but arriving early, making sure that you're prepared um, on time and you have all of your information together. It just, it, uh, gives the impression that you have yourself organized and that you're ready for this. Uh, so shaking hands, again, this is pre-COVID. Obviously, we can't do that now. Making eye contact. Um, if you're not talking with someone and making eye contact with them, that gives off a different impression. It might give off an impression that you're not being honest or that you're not confident or that uh, you're trying to talk about things that maybe you're really unsure of and you're hoping that you won't get questioned a lot about um, just your validity to be able to talk with someone and make eye contact. Your language uh, should be very chosen appropriately. We'll talk about this a little bit more um, when we get to the next slide about conversations through texting. Uh, but you want to make sure that you're using appropriate language. You don't go into a job interview and swear your head off and drop, you know, different swear words, swear words when you're trying to explain a situation not professional. People just know not to do that. Uh, keeping all of your answers positive. Um, you want to make sure that you come across as someone who has a positive outlook, right? You don't want to be that person that goes in there and, you know, how are you doing? Oh, not very good. You know that you have to present yourself in a way that you're a positive person, you know, you're, you're on, the, on your game, you're, you're ready to work, if you don't present that attitude, then people aren't gonna take that away. So you have to make sure that you go in thinking, okay, I've got to nail this one out of the park. Did we just lose power? We sure did. Seems like it's okay now. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, okay, so you're going to bring your, your resume, even if you've sent it to them, because you don't know if they have one, a copy or not, you want to seem prepared. Um, and if you don't have one and you wish that you did, you're going to realize that that might have been something that you should have prepared ahead of time. But again, if you're not thinking about it, you might not think to do that. You want to have your questions prepared in advance. Um, we talk about this a lot in preparing for interviews. So that you're ready, you're prepared, you've done your research. It shows that you have put some time and effort into this. Um, and if you don't have those things ready, you're going to leave a bad impression with the person. Mm -hmm. So Becky, I can't seem to see the slide numbers. So I don't know if we went past where you were supposed to go, but no, I, no, I can I have just it all printed out. Um, okay. Just Lori, one other thing that somebody said was put your phone away before the interview, making yeah. sure it's on silent. That's a good one. That's a huge one. Um, oh, uh, someone else said, don't put your elbows on the table. <laughs> wow, oh. that's like my mother. But yes, <laughs> you're right. You're right. Okay, go ahead, Lori. Okay, so there are hidden rules all through society. Everywhere you go, every part, every walk of life, there are definitely hidden rules. So, you know, you all probably have situations and things you do, hobbies and whatnot in your life that have hidden rules that not everybody would know. So go ahead and type into the chat if you have a hobby or an activity or something that um, has hidden rules that people may not, um, not everybody may know. So I'm going to proceed and then Becky, you can just jump in if people chime in with, with extra hidden rules, okay? So some examples off the top of our heads, you know, if anybody's ever golfed, golf is just absolutely riddled with hidden rules and rarely are they ever written anywhere they're just little things that people won't tell you until you break the rule and then they'll say you know you know you're not supposed to walk across in front of somebody who's about to shoot you know things like that so golf is absolutely riddled with them from the way you dress to the way you conduct yourself to letting slower players uh, slower players should let faster players play through and all kinds of things like that but if you don't know when you get to the golf course what some of those rules are you can end up looking kind of silly. So riding the bus is another one. There's a whole system of how things are done when you ride the bus. It's not really written down anywhere. And if, you know, I don't take the bus very often. So if you said to me, here's a ticket, get yourself home on the bus, Lori, it would be a struggle for me to do that because I just don't understand the system very well. So, you know, I don't know where to put the ticket and I don't really know how to get off the bus or where the bus goes just because I don't know the rules it's not because I'm not a smart person and then the the whole place of worship um, thing there's so many hidden rules in places of worship um, and they're just traditional and cultural and all those kinds of things but for example if you enter a Catholic church and take your shoes off and ask where you should put your shoes they would think you were nuts uh, versus if you enter a mosque and walk in with your shoes on they would think you were nuts because the two culture, the two religions just have different traditions. Essentially, the same thing goes on in one place of worship versus another, but each one has their own hidden rules and their own traditions. And if you don't know them ahead of time, you can end up in trouble. Lori, I have one person here that said, uh, I watch a lot of plays. And if you're watching a musical, you're not supposed to applaud after each song. It breaks the flow. Right. However, everyone does, she says. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> That's a good one though. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. So the next exercise I would like everybody to do is get your pen and paper or your word pad if you want, Murray. Um, and <laughs> go ahead and just jot down right now, first five priorities that come to mind for you. What are the top five priorities in your life today? We'll give you just a minute to jot those down. Don't overthink it, just jot them down. You can share them, but you don't have to. So if you don't feel like sharing your list, you don't have to. So what we want to think about, does anybody want to share their list? If you want to, just go ahead and type it into the chat. And what I'm wondering is where work appears on everyone's list. 
finding work or keeping work or working, having an income, where does that fall on your earnings list? I have one person that says finding work is number one for me. Uh -huh. Very top of our list. Okay. And that's good. Work should be in the top. Definitely should always be in the top. Maybe um, finding work, you know, if you're looking for work, may, it may end up at number one. Once you're working, um, you know, your personal health and probably your family's, your family's well-being is right up there as well, I would think. Yeah, I have work, income, and career are top three for someone. Okay, excellent. Well, those all kind of go together, don't they? So now we're going to transition into the hidden rules of work here. Is this where you're supposed to take that? Yeah, this one is mine. Okay. All right. Um, so one thing that you need to remember when you're looking for work and you're hired at this new position is that you need to make sure that your employer knows that work is one of the highest priorities in your life, that you love your job. Um, over the years, I've done a lot of interviewing for positions. And when I ask this question, you know, why would you like to come and work for us? If I get the answer, cause I need a job, probably not gonna bode well, because I want someone who wants to be a part of our organization and who wants to invest in it so they can be part of our team. I don't need someone that I can just give a paycheck to. So they want to make sure, you want to make sure that they know that this is a top priority for you because you are so excited about this experience. So that's not something that they're going to ask you, like, are you excited? Um, but you need to convey that to them so that they know that they've made a really good decision with hiring you. So when you get this job, when you start working, there's a couple of things that you need to make sure that you're doing and probably nobody's gonna tell you to do them, but you need to make sure you're doing them. And one of them is be on time and stay for your whole shift. Um, this is actually kind of a bone of contention with me just because when I was managing people, they didn't think it was a big deal if they would show up five minutes late or if they would show up you know, after their lunch break, kind of be a couple minutes late. Remember they're gonna leave five minutes early, it's not a big deal. And then you do the multiplication of, okay, so if five people did that every single day for five days out of the week, how many hours of work are we losing? And your employer is going to know that. They're going to watch for that. So you, don't, you never, ever want to do that. You want to be on time, stay for your whole shift. Returning promptly from your breaks, again, that's such a big deal. I mean, it doesn't seem like it's that, you know, much of a concern. It was only a couple of minutes makes an impression. You don't ever want to do that. So you just know to be back and start when the time is that you're supposed to start. Um, don't ask or expect other colleagues to cover for you so that you can leave early. Um, this is just not professional. Nobody's going to tell you not to do that, but you should just know when you're working, you have to put in seven hours for your day. You start and you finish and you work your seven hours. That's your responsibility. So a lot of people run into the pitfall of thinking, well, I don't need to do it this way because this way isn't the fastest or this way isn't the best or this doesn't make sense to me. So I'm going to do it my own way, but it's not the way that your employer asked you to do it. Do what your employer says. Even if you think you know better, you need to make sure that you're doing it the employer's way, unless it's unsafe. That's a whole completely different conversation but you need to do it your employer's way. You've accepted the position through them. You need to do it their way. Now, in, in a long-term position, could you add some feedback or some advice later on down the road? Sure, but when you start, it's their way and that's the way it needs to be done. Uh, making sure that you don't have negative talk or gossip with other employees. No one's gonna tell you not to do this and it's probably gonna be really tempting to kind of chime in be part of the conversation because you're meeting new people and you're getting to know people. It always comes back to the employer one way or the other, whether it's from an employee or they hear about it over, they overhear it and you don't know that they're listening or somehow, some way, it will get back to the employer. So just stay away from that. It's just not a positive place for you to be. Ah, here's a big one. You just don't talk about money. You don't talk about whether you're having a really, really hard time with finances 
or you've got everything together, you've got a huge amount of savings in the bank, or you just won a big lottery ticket, or you've got family that has lots of money that's been helping you out, don't talk about money. You don't know who you're talking to, you don't know what their background is, you don't know who they know, you need to make sure that you keep that private, whether it's good or it's bad. Um, you want to stay away from the conversations where you ask people how much do they make per hour or their salary. It is opening up a can of worms where you don't know if it's going to be something that's going to help you or hurt you. It's private. It's not something that you need to talk about with your coworkers. It's not something you need to talk about uh, with anybody else, maybe in your department. If you have a question or a concern, you go to your manager or your supervisor. Those are the only people that you need to talk about when it comes to anything with your salary or income. There is a stigma about being on assistance. Um, not fair, it's not right, but it's there. So don't even bring it into the workplace. Don't talk about it. Um, it's not something that you need to mention to anybody. It has absolutely no bearing on your work ethic has no bearing on how well you're going to do or why you got the job or why you should have the job. It's just not something that you should come up with in, in conversation. It's not something that you should volunteer about yourself. And it's not something you should ask somebody else about. Again, it's private. It has nothing to do with why you're there and what you're doing for work. Um, do not ask coworkers or supervisors to lend you money. This has happened to me in the past. Um, where as a supervisor, I was asked to give this person a pay advance and it is not professional. It's usually something that's treading on some very, very bad waters as far as uh, opening up a can of worms for other questions that they may ask or that it might circle around. You need to make sure that you are not involving anything with work that isn't just work. Your personal problems, uh, your personal uh, family situations or maybe your opinions or it needs to stay out of work and that comes right down to having any kind of conversation with money. It's personal, it's private, it doesn't belong in the workplace. Uh, again, same, do not ask for an advance in your pay. It's, it's the same thing that we were talking about. So this is you, Lori. Okay, so another thing you don't want to get into talking about too much is your health. So unless it directly affects your ability to do the job at hand, there's no need to tell them about every health problem you've ever had or ever will have in your life. So the difference is if I have diabetes, that could affect me on a daily basis at work. There could be an emergency and my supervisor needs to understand how to react to that emergency in something like that. If I may or may not need knee surgery in two years time, Nobody needs to know that. And all that does is put a re big red circle around your name if you're bringing up unnecessary medical information. So something that's relevant to the job or that could be a hazard on the job for other people or yourself, you wanna make sure your supervisor knows. Otherwise, if it's something that is down the line or you know, three years ago there was a heart problem but it hasn't been an issue since, there's no need to bring that up. It only makes you um, a worry for the employer that you're going to be calling in sick all the time. And same thing with the criminal record. If you happen to have a criminal record, if the employer does not ask about it, you don't be the one to bring it up. If your supervisor asks or HR asks, you do have to disclose that you have a criminal record if they ask you, uh, or if they ask to run a record check, it's up to you, but usually your job is dependent upon a record check if they're asking for one. However, if nobody brings it up, don't you be the one to bring it up. And I don't really care if you're sitting around the lunch table with 12 other people and they're all talking about their criminal records. You still don't need to bring yours up. Nobody needs to know that it's your private business. So overall, keep in mind to be considerate of other people's points of views, backgrounds, and so forth. Think for a second before you speak with people you don't know especially, because you don't know what their background is, you don't know what their family situation is, who they're married to, uh, who, you know, what their whole situation looks like. Be understanding of other cultural heritages, ethnicities, experiences and outlooks, because they just may be different than your own. And maybe you might learn something. If you stop and think and listen first, um, and try to understand other people's perspectives, 
you know, you may learn some interesting information. You may learn, you know, all about different cultures, different backgrounds, different people's, just people's different experiences. But it's really important that you stop and think for a second before you shoot your mouth off, especially when you're new in a job. Try your best not to make assumptions about people and what they may be or may not be or, or anything of that sort. Just try to be open-minded and kind and listen first. So personal issues and family issues are another thing you can leave at home. Dragging them into work is not going to help anybody. Um, it's just going to be unprofessional on your part. And if you're talking about past employers at all, it should only be positive and brief. Don't go on and on about how great it was at your last job, because why are you still not there then? Um, and your new employer doesn't want to hear all about how great it was at your last place. Uh, but also they don't want to hear about how awful it was. So, you know, brief and positive is the only things you should be saying about past employers. And other things I would steer clear of, especially until you get a real feel for the culture of your new workplace, um, sex, drugs, politics, and religion, those are all touchy subjects and uh, just, I would just leave them alone. So Liam Neeson's gonna Google you and find you. Um, <laughs> don't talk about work on social media unless it's just to say, you know, I'm loving my new job at Pathways. You don't discuss uh, work negatively on social media because even if you think you have your social media locked down tight, no one could ever find you. Oh, they can find you. It's not that hard. Um, they will creep your social media when they're in the recruitment process. So anything on your social media now, if you're looking for work, should be, you know, squeaky clean and nothing you wouldn't want a potential employer to see. I don't know why the slides are not advancing. Um, if you are issued a company computer or phone or pager or whatever technology they're using, uh, those are for work, not for your personal activity. Um, and make sure that you understand their cell phone policy uh, for your personal cell phone. Some workplaces are tolerant of it, others are not. Others require you to have one for, for work-related purposes. Um, but you want to make sure you understand that fully and, and um, behave accordingly. Because it's one of the top reasons that we see people losing jobs is because they're on their phone too much. So this one I think is me. Are you taking it over here? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So there's a lot of employers that actually will communicate with you through text or, or even if there may be an email that you're sending them. I know in the construction field, a lot of it is communicated through text because there are different job sites and uh, a lot of different moving parts. So you want to make sure that when you're connecting with your employer or your supervisor or quite frankly, anybody from work that you're using full sentences. So you, you can't assume that the employer knows what your short form means. So it can come across very unprofessional. It's inconsiderate to uh, communicate this way. Uh, you need to make sure that you're really aware and, and you're taking the time to maybe reread what you're going to send before you hit send to make sure it fits all of that. So here's an example. Um, oh, you know what? I can't see it because my chat boxes are See if you can even make sense of that, everybody. We, oh, I have a copy here. Okay, I get so, feels like this all the time, don't you, Becky? I, yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. Um, so this, I have a copy of it here. So this is supposed to say, hey, waiting for my ride. Um, she's late, FFS. We won't even talk about what that means because that's obviously swearing. Uh, again, ATM at the moment looks like I'm 20 minutes late. I don't know how long meet you at the job. I mean, you could probably muddle your way through that to figure out what they're going to say. There's some short forms there. There's some slang words there, some abbreviations. But really, what you're trying to say is, hi, Jim. I'm sorry. I'm running about 20 minutes late. I'll meet you at the job site. Your boss does not need to know any of your opinions about who you're riding with or any obviously negative thoughts you might have towards this person. Um, you want to make sure that if you're late, you give an estimated time of arrival. That's really all your boss needs to know. 
doesn't need to know why, doesn't need to know how, doesn't need to know how you're feeling. Just, you know what, I apologize because I was supposed to be there. I'm gonna be about 20 minutes late. I'll meet you at the job site. End of story. Very, very simple. Mm -hmm. So that comes across in a much more professional way than obviously the first example of kind of, you, you read it and you think, what are they trying to say? Because it, can, it will come across as very uh, unprofessional and, and inconsiderate. Because if you have someone who doesn't appreciate that kind of language, you're not doing well. You're not doing well with keeping that professional um, appearance that you want to have. Um, when you're at co-op or work, because this applies to both, because co-op is basically a working interview, um, you, there may be consequences that you might not have considered about the way that you're acting or the things that you're doing. Um, employers will judge pathways in all of our future clients on the way that you work and conduct yourself, whether it's positive or negative. And I've seen both sides of it. I've seen an employer who will automatically come to Pathways because they know the kind of caliber of clients and students that we have. You know, they're, they're well-trained, they are professional, and they will come to us before they go to any other kind of forum to look for people to hire for future positions because we've made that really good impression with them. I've also actually been an employer who started at a company that I didn't really know anything about and the subject came up of Pathways Co-op and what was said to me was, oh, you don't want to do that. You don't want to take those Pathways Co-ops because it's a lot of work. Obviously, I work for Pathways now, so I obviously know that that's not true to be, but when I first started at that job, that was what I heard because someone probably had conducted themselves in an unprofessional way and it taints the impression for the whole organization based on one or two people who have not made good choices about how they're gonna conduct themselves. Oh, this is me. Oh, it's you. So, an example of what Becky's talking about. So this happened fairly recently, uh, a co-op supervisor, you know, when people go out on a co-op placement, there's a little evaluation form that the supervisor sends back to us. And this is what I got back. Insufficient work ethic, smelled of marijuana, showed pictures of a bong on his cell phone, showed the miniature a tattoo of a huge penis on his stomach area. Not appropriate at all. And this is an employer that we had a good relationship with. And so, you know, now this person has kind of tainted that. And these are things, you know, everyone goes through this training. If you go and skill, if you take a skills course, you see, you go through this very presentation where we talk about not doing all these things, not showing up smelling like you're under the influence, not, you know, showing inappropriate, whatever, behaving like a professional, um, but still happened. So it happens all the time, unfortunately. So what did this person not understand? They didn't really understand any of the rules, I don't think. I don't think <laughs> that there were hidden rules there. Um, and how does that reflect on Pathways? Well, obviously not well. It doesn't reflect well on me personally, on Pathways as an organization, or on future clients' opportunities there. So, and the chances of somebody who, you know, is so unprofessional retaining employment are probably low. Are you going from here, or is it still me? No, you're finishing oh, to the end. Yeah. Okay, so when you're in your new workplace, you want to just observe and learn the hidden rules. And that's my biggest piece of advice because it varies so much from one workplace to the other. And even little things like when and where and how do people have lunch can be a big thing that you want to know when you get there. Do people tend to eat at their desks? Do, does everybody go into the lunchroom? Are there certain seats designated in the lunchroom, you know, without being officially designated, but they're designated? Um, you want to just kind of watch, sit back and watch and see how that all plays out. Read any policies and procedures that are given to you, read them and understand them, and that'll give you a lot of clues. And if you do those things, you'll quickly learn the hidden rules in your new workplace. So. These are just some of the general ones. Every workplace has their own hidden rules. And, um, but just keeping in mind that there are hidden rules in every workplace will get you a long part, a long part of the way there. So um, with this in mind, you guys are prepared to be very successful. So we'll open up to any questions that anybody has now.
been a fairly quiet group. I think that, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see any questions at the moment. If that's it, guys, I think we had lots of good chat as we were going, but um, thank you so much for joining us today. And we will see you next week. Oh, okay. Um, how actively are you receiving job opportunities? Um, it varies by the industry and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. We are starting to see businesses are co definitely coming back strong from COVID the specific in certain industries more than others, but we are definitely starting to see a rebound right now. For sure. For sure. For sure. Um, thanks everybody. We'll see you next week for our guest speaker on financial wellness. And um, he's going to talk about lots of interesting topics. I know nobody likes to talk about finances, but it's actually an interesting presentation. So I look forward to seeing everyone next week for that one. Thanks, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.